I'm back and it's time for our Bible study. Today I'm going to tackle the resurrection of Lazarus. So like I said, I won't be going through uh, all of John um, and uh, because I'm going to start Revelation in January, which I think uh, people will really enjoy. Uh, anyway, so let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for drawing us here today. We thank you for opening up your scripture to us. And we pray that you will help us to um, discern your word and give us encouragement. Amen. So yeah, so the, today we're going to go into the resurrection of Lazarus. Um, the death, the, first we'll start with the death. And before I start this, there's a, a couple assumptions that I have to clarify about the, um, the way they looked at life after death in the ancient world. Uh, for, the, for the Greeks, for example, they were quite different than the, uh, the uh, Jews. Greeks believed that you had an eternal soul, that your spirit was encapsulated by your physical being for a season, and it would be like a prison. That was their general belief. Upon dying, you would, if you were one of the extremely special people, you would go off to a place called the Isle of the Blessed, which sat in the clouds and, and had the gods, and the philosophers would go there. And if you um, were just a normal human being, you would go down to Hades, you would cross the river Styx, and you would spend your eternity in kind of a uh, less than human and a beastly state. It wasn't very nice. Now, uh, no one could return from Hades, so that belief was that that was, it, it would kind of look like hell, to, to be honest with you, a contemporary version of hell. That was Hades. Jews themselves didn't hold this view. Jews did not believe we had to be eternal souls by our nature. In the creation story, um, you have Adam and Eve, or humanity, created ex nihilo, or what's known as out of nothing. And it is considered a good thing. So having this humanity um, for a Jew was considered good. It wasn't a prison like the Greeks held to and so this affected how they looked at their afterlife. Um, now, Jews mostly, in the, at least in the first five books of the Bible, they don't talk a lot about an afterlife, and there doesn't seem to be a solid theological assumption of afterlife. Um, the eternal life that they thought they were going to get was through having children, having their name passed on, but they certainly didn't have this idea of going off into a, a heaven or a Isle of the Blessed, as the Greeks did or a, a hell or Hades, as, as it were. They just didn't in those first five books. And that's important because there's a group in the Bible called the Sadducees who are going to hold to those first five books because they don't like this idea of resurrection, which eventually would come to be the full-blown Jewish theology on the afterlife. And I'll explain it, uh, that when I get there. Um, so Jews didn't hold this view, and there was a lot of talk about um, of, of an afterlife belief. There was... Uh, in the Old Testament, there are moments like when David's uh, cursed by his, uh, and his child dies because of his behavior. He says, well, this is okay because we're, uh, I'm going to see my child again one day. What that means, we don't know. Um, it's not described. Uh, even a psalm like uh, Psalm 23, which we've traditionally interpreted, uh, and I will dwell in his house forever, is actually not the, the right terminology. It's, oh, I will dwell in his house, which would mean the temple all the days of my life. That's how you would read Psalm 23. And you've got these uh, moments in the Bible where there seems to be an afterlife, or at least a spiritual world, but it's certainly not consistent. Uh, of course, there's a time where Saul calls for, gets the witch to call forth the prophet's spirit to talk to. That's one story. But of course, all of these are seen as negative stories um, and not... Uh, certainly not a full-blown theology of the afterlife. We don't really find a full-blown theology of the afterlife until Daniel. And Daniel's one of our latest books in the Old Testament. And it's uh, Daniel 12, and I'll read it to you, is where you really first find a resurrection theology in our scriptures. And Daniel 12 goes like this. And at that time shall all rise Michael, the great prince, who was in who who has charge of your people. And there shall be a tra time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found and written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth, this is the component, shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. 
So this is the first time you see this theology that we call resurrection. What resurrection is, and it can only mean, it comes from a Greek word named anastasis. Anastasis basically means the physical reanimation of a body. So it, it is a physical being that's come from the dead and now is physically available to us. What resurrection doesn't mean, and this has been a component that um, is very difficult for people to understand, is it doesn't mean a disembodied spirit. It can't mean that. There was a Greek word for a disembodied spirit. There are a few, but uh, the main one was phantasma. Uh, we, we get the word phantom from. When they see Jesus on the lake, is that a phantasma? Is that a, is that a spirit, as it were? But anastasis doesn't mean that. Anastasis means that the belief is that at some point, the human being, the resurrection, is the physical re-embodiment of a human being. And the Jewish belief by the time of Daniel is clearly that. And it would continue through the intertestamental periods between the New and the Old, the Old and New Testament, through all of the writings of the intertestamental period, and there were many that were considered valuable to the Jewish people, that taught that on the day of the Lord would come a day when all good Jews would be raised from the dead. They would be resurrected. So that was the theology of Jesus in his day. And Jesus doesn't go against it at all. He continues within this anastasis theology and uh he nowhere is it that he's that they are looking for him to go off and die and go to heaven or go to hell as it were there's no mention of that within uh, uh the first century second second temple period um you'll find very little jewish writing about it in the times we do see it like in the testament of job it's clearly been influenced by the testament of job or sorry the testament of solomon is clearly influenced by Greeks. And you understand Greeks and Jews inter intersected, and there's no doubt that Greek thinking is within the, that testament. So the belief system, first of all, of those first century Second Temple periods was that good Jews would be resurrected. Now, how that happened, Maccabees tells us that, that a good Jew that gets resurrected is one who dies as a martyr, so who dies against the overlords. So this was a common belief in the ancient world, and it certainly was one that Jesus would have been dealing with. Now, the reason the Sadducees didn't like the concept of re re resurrection was because they were puppets of the Roman state. Every time an empire comes in, they take a local group of people, and they get wealthy off the empire being there by maintaining order. These were the Sadducees. The reason they didn't like resurrection is resurrection, as I just said, was assumed to be a... Uh, a theology that inspired revolution because if you were a good Jew who died as a martyr against the empires or the beasts as they would call it from Daniel then you would be automatically resurrected so a lot of the motive of the first century second temple uh, rebels was this idea that if I do this I will be set free I'll be uh, liberated from from this world and one day when God comes back or not when God comes back, when God sends his Messiah, his king, his special inspired son of man, then at that point I will be raised with the rest of the people. So the Pharisees, on their end, love the concept of, of anastasis, of resurrection. Now these two worlds, so basically in the Jewish world there was a belief that um, that there was, no, there was no life after death within the Sadducees, and we know that the Pharisees believed in the physical resurrection, and we know that Jesus also believed in the resurrection and promoted that. So once you understand that, then you can understand what these people were actually looking forward to who were following Christ. Now their view was that one day this oppressed nation, these people of God would be set free from the oppressor, in this case the Romans, but they've been under a multiplicity of empires, and that on that day good Jews would be resurrected that they would rule from the temple in Jerusalem and that they would conquer the world and the world would be restored as it were. So Jesus is put into this role. Is he the son of man? Is he the Messiah? Is he the, um, is he the one that's coming from God? Now, nobody expected God to come. They expected um, a, a figure that was like Moses, like a David figure, a Davidic figure, and they would follow in his footsteps. So in line with this is Jesus teaching that he is now, in John, like this time in John, 
he's made it so clear that they're trying to stone him, that he is God. And this is just stunning revelation for these people. This was not expected by anyone at any point of time. So this revelation has come out, and what do we do now? The key question is, is he the Son of Man? What is he doing? Is he bringing the day of the Lord? That's what they're wondering. Uh, questions like, who will sit at your right and your left? Um, of course, we know that uh, the disciples are arguing about that, which reflects their belief in this, that he's, who's going to sit and have the seat of power beside him in the temple. Um, obviously, they don't know what they're talking about. They want to throw fire down on their enemies. Uh, Jesus says they don't want know what they're talking about. And we see even in this text, in chapter 11 of John, is where we find the, the famous story of the resurrection of Lazarus, when he comes in and he finds out that he's, uh, Lazarus is sick. Now the disciples are, are sitting there, and Jesus says, this illness does not lead to death, it brings the glory to God. Again, this is an act that's going to show who God is, and it's going to show, it's going to bring him glory, not them, um, so that the Son of Man might be glorified through it. Now, it's interesting in John's Gospel that the glorification of God happens on the cross, and through the resurrection, so that's an, an important understanding. So he says, let's go to Judea. Now they're saying, hey, hold on. We just about got stoned there. Um, Judea, this place where Lazarus lives, is about two miles away, or four stadia, they're called, in the Greek world. And they're basically saying, hey, let's not go there. And Jesus says, has already said that this, this, this illness doesn't lead to death, so why would you go? Um, and then we get into this misunderstanding. Jesus says he's asleep. They don't understand what he's talking about. Then he tells them that you need to work in the 12 days, the 12 hours while he's here. We see this creation day language, um, the light of the world, even more creation language uh, before the darkness comes. He's talking about himself. Remember, John's all about the creational language and, and how he's going to restore or create new creation. So the, he says... Finally, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, uh, but I will go wake him. The disciples clearly don't understand. They say, well, obviously, if he's fallen asleep, why would we put our life on the line um, to go wake him up? Then he says, no, he's dead. And for your sake, I'm glad this happened. Now, he stays away for two days before he does this. So, um, and he says, I, 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 for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. So this is part of the process of them believing in who he is. Now remember, they have a belief system on Jesus already. They believe Jesus fits a certain framework, as it were, about who God is, and that includes uh, that he's a king, that he's a messiah, uh, that those were common terms, that he was the son of man. Uh, out of Daniel, the son of man, uh, the ancient of days, chapter 7, all of those fit within their worldview, and he was going to come deliver them. But what does he mean by he wants, he's glad he stayed away because he wants them to believe? Because the belief that we're going to get to is a belief that triumphs over that current worldview. And that's going to, if they find life in him, it's going to actually turn over their world and change the way they live. And rather than being a group of people longing to um, face martyrdom for the, for the name of God, they become, as it were, uh, a people that are willing to sacrifice because this isn't it. So, he goes to the resurrection and the life. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. Now, that's an important thing. Apparently, in the ancient world, and uh, this is somewhat disputed, but uh, some people say it was later, but it makes sense in this context that at least John believed this. Um, in the ancient world, a spirit would hover, the Jews believed, for three days, and then it would leave. Now, um, so he stays away for four days. So there's no doubt. There's no spirit there left. There's no, uh, he's really, really dead. If you've seen um, um, Monty Python, you'll understand that reference. Um, he, he's really dead by the time he gets there. Now, Mary sees him. And uh, she's been out with the Jews. And you can imagine the atmosphere. This is an ancient Middle East uh, uh, funeral expression. They met for days on end. There would be weeping and wailing. Um, and she hears Jesus is coming, so she runs out to meet him. Uh, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And what she's referring to there is everyone believed Jesus was a healer, clearly, and he could have healed him from this illness. Uh, also an interesting thing to note, um, especially in our world of pandemic awareness today, 
that people in the ancient world died of disease much more regularly, of flus much more regularly. There just wasn't treatment uh, as we would understand it. So they were much more dependent on healers back then. Healers were all around. Jesus was considered a healer, a divine healer as well, but that wasn't unheard of in the ancient world like it would be today. Um, so she's assuming he's one of these healers. I remember, she doesn't think he's God. Um, but she says, Kyrios, or Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know what whatever you ask from God will give you, God will give you. So here she's assuming that God will potentially reanimate Lazarus. Now she could be using references. It, it's unlikely that it's going to happen. But she would have Old Testament texts where prophets from God um, brought back the dead. And you can think of Elijah with the child and, and different stories like that. Um, so she's kind of throwing a Hail Mary here that he's going to be able to be a prophet level. So you have, he's a Messiah, he's a healer, and a prophet. Okay? And all of those were, um, yeah, those were all celebrated and possible identities Jesus could have in that time. Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Now, when he says that, this has become a common belief system. It would be like if you were at a funeral and your, uh, God forbid, your family member has died and somebody walks in, you said, oh, gee, uh, you know, and you thought he was a healer and you said, well, can you help out? And he says, oh, he's, he'll be in heaven. So that, that's how um, it was at that time. He just, everyone believed in heaven, or sorry, in the resurrection. So when he says he will rise again, yeah, okay, she already, she's, yeah, and she's going to respond, like, almost in a snappy way, I believe, because she must be frustrated that Jesus didn't come right away, right? Um, if she really believes that he could have healed her. So, he says, uh, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So, in other words, I know he's a good Jew. I know he's a good guy. He's uh, forgiven by God. They did believe they needed forgiveness, but they had the temple to do that, and, um, and he's going to be part of this resurrection. So what she's saying is, I already know that. I already know that. Of course, what she wants is something immediate. The context needs to be immediate. And then Jesus said to her something that is profound for its time and was unheard of. No one was expecting. He says, and, and we've heard this, so it's hard for us to grasp what he did. He goes, ego and me, which is the I am again. And whenever he adds these I am's, John's hinting again at his divinity, right? I am the resurrection and the life. Now, this is a combination. So, now resurrection is not a concept that God will do one day. Resurrection is now a person. He is embodied in front of you. This is not just a theological promise. This is a guarantee by me because I, Jesus saying, am God. I am the one that's going to reanimate, resurrect. I am in front of you. Eternity is now at your doorstep. Um, no one thought that. No one had any a concept that this was coming. It was just, uh, um, it was just unheard of. So, whoever believes in me, though he die or they die, would be the language. It would be my, my interpretation doesn't it isn't uh, sensitive that way, but. Whoever believes in me, though they die, yet shall they live. So now he's put the resurrection, rather than being around a good Jew, being a good Jew, to the ever they are who believes in him. Now he's located that I am it, I am the life, I am the resurrection. And he's now drawn the circle of those who will be involved in that. And if it's anyone who believes in him, he's completely transformed the people of God. It's no longer people who have been circumcised or what have you. It is now the full people of God. That includes Gentiles. That includes bad Jews who repent and believe in him. That includes good Jews. That includes everyone. Because he is now the resurrection and the life. He's not going, you'll notice, with Daniel's system, formula, that only the good ones will get through. He's certainly not going through the Maccabean formula where it would be the martyrs who will be resurrected. He's saying, whoever believes in me. So resurrection has come to Mary's doorstep. He's not just a Messiah. He's not just the Son of Man. He's not just... He is God, the creational God, who humanity has spurned, who's come back, 
And he's the one that is going to recreate or create anew, and that through the resurrection. And he'll do that, of course, through his sacrifice. And this picture of Lazarus, which we'll finish next week, and we'll talk about the rest of this, is the picture of he, the one who can bring this, the creational God, walking in the garden, who's come back to the to garden full of weeds, but he's come to bring life. That's the picture here. And the key for Mary is, do you believe this? And that's where he goes next. He says, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So, And this is this concept within Second Temple Judaism that was common. There was the first death, your natural bodily death, but there was also this possibility of what they call the second death, and Revelation talks about it. And this is this idea that there is another death that you could at post-resurrection if you do not wish this God. And that, that's a whole other theological thing. And if you want to stick with me in January, I'll go through Revelation, and one day we will get through the second death. So, she says, so he says, do you believe? This? this is the utter critical question that I think is absolutely an essential question to all human beings. If Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life, it changes the whole game. And I'll explain in a second why. If he's not, he's irrelevant. Okay, because he's not presented as a theological good teacher, as a nice figure. He's presented as the living God incarnate in front of us to bring renewed life. And he's presented as one who is going to resurrect the dead. And he's going to prove that through the resuscitation of Lazarus and ultimately through his own resurrection. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe. Now listen to her response, though, because I don't think it's the belief that he that he wants her to have, she's going to get yet. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Messiah. That, that, that's not what he asked. That's a king. The Son of God. Again, that didn't mean what we think of that as a second member of the Trinity. They didn't have Trinitarian theology. Who is coming into the world? Fair enough. She believes he's this deliverer, but he's asking her to go one step further, isn't he? He's saying, am I, that I am the resurrection of life. I am the life in the garden. I'm the tree of life in the garden. I am the resurrection. I'm going to create ex nihilo and I'll recreate out of nothing the resurrection, the new life. Why that's an incredibly important question to human beings is because what you believe about where you go affects the way you live your life. Let me give you an example. If you believe that you are going to die as a martyr for Islam, you are told that you will get, I think it's 72 virgins. So that is a motive to guarantee your eternal life, and that's why some people fly planes into buildings or blow themselves up in cars. If you're a Jew and you believe in the ancient world, you believe that resurrection is for the good Jews, and uh, the ones especially that martyr, you will become a knife man in ancient Israel, and you'll have a revolutionary society. Um, if you're a Greek and you believe that all that matters is your spirit leaving, that your body is a prison, then how you treat your body and how you act sexually or, or physically or how you treat other people is irrelevant because, as, as Paul uses their argument against them, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die or we become spirit people. Our physical beings are irrelevant. But if you believe that God is going to renew all things, that he's going to renew creation, that he is going to bring his life force back in to renew all things. And being human, being physical, is good. It's just we're messed up. And that God's ultimate end, then, is a promise of the renewal of all things, including you, including me. That means that every graveside we sit by is a comma, not a period. What that means, and ultimately in the end, is that the way we live our life now has eternal consequences. So if we live for ourselves, and we want to be gods in and of ourselves, God will give us his way, and we will inherit the inheritance of the curse, which includes death, ultimately. But God has come back in this story, and if he really is Jesus Christ, I am the resurrection and the life, and I've come back to renew all things. That means that death, as we understand it today, is not what the world sees. And if we believe that, we'll live our lives in such a way that it can be transformative rather than being self-centered. It can be for the other 
And in fact, it should be together because we recognize that this world is an it. Most people right now in our society believe a vague hope of going to heaven when they die. Maybe some people believe that they're destined for hell. You've heard the, the jokes. That's where all my friends will be. These aren't ultimately the things that Jesus is calling us to hold on to. He's calling us to either continue to be like God and whatever that judgment looks, trying to be like God ourselves, and that judgment will come, and we will get our will will be done. Eventually, it seems that that's the judgment of God. Or we will be resurrected to him by believing in him, by finding identity. That means that we start now our life. We never really die. Yes, there is the moment where our physical body will die and we will be renewed or re resurrected. But ultimately, this is not it. What we do matters now. You don't need to live for a bucket list because you have to get a certain amount of things done because then you're gone. You can live your life now for something bigger and greater. That's the promise of, the, of this text. The promise is an incredible promise, and it will affect how you live, how you view death. And in a time like this, this, this crazy pandemic, where, let's be honest, there is a fear of death, and it's being exposed culturally, because most people um, have a plan for their life. They want to live. And this puts the option up, but what was normal for an ancient, we have cured a lot of those diseases, or at least we know how to treat them. But here we are now in this new world where the pandemic has come and people are living in fear and, and terror. I've heard about the mental health issues, all of them very understanding. But if this is true, we don't need to live that way. We still need to live and love our neighbor, wear our masks, social distance, do the right things. But ultimately, we get this promise that if we live now, we believe in him, that our tomb's going to be empty. Those people we've lost their tombs can be empty. We may spend the rest of eternity with him. That's incredible good news. The question at the end is what I'll leave with you today and I'll leave on Sunday. Do you believe this? That to me, it seems the most important question you'll ever be asked. Mm -hmm.